probably one of the greatest saints of our tradition, one of the most brilliant minds of our tradition, was St. Augustine. Going all the way back to the 3rd, 4th, 5th century period, when the church was in a lot of flux and needing a real wisdom and real uh, focus, St. Augustine is the one that comes along. Now, mind you, St. Augustine was probably one of the worst sinners in his young life. He was not known for being one of these moral people like was described by St. Paul. He was desperately in need of something and he didn't know what. He came up with this famous quote, Lord, our God, you have created us for yourself. You have created us for yourself. That particular phrase is a revelation by St. Augustine that he's coming to realize what it is that's going on inside of him. O oh Lord, our God, you have created us. I don't think anybody here would take exception to that phrase. If you're here and you believe in Jesus Christ, you know that you are part of God's creation. You were created by God. You were brought into existence by the hand of God. You sit here now because you know that God has created you. But I think even more telling is the rest of the quote. Lord, you have created us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest with you. Our hearts are restless until they rest with you. You know, so often I think, you know, we don't recognize our restlessness. I think we just begin to think it's kind of a normal thing that we get excited and we're searching and seeking and wanting and doing and running and going and, and not realizing that we're searching for God. We're looking to seek God. Back last century, it was a long time ago, I took some courses in psychology. I got a bachelor's in the psychology. And I remember that all of the different theories all kind of focus on when they're trying to understand the human being today, especially when we become adults, they like to look at the family of origin. All of them like to go back to the childhood and see, well, what was their formation like? What was their home life like? What were their parents like? From a religious perspective, we've always understood that. The family is the most important cell of existence. You can't have society, you can't have a church if you don't have strong families. And so with Christmas still fresh in our minds, the epiphany still fresh in our minds, the baptism of the Lord still fresh in our minds, we now come to these couple of weeks between now and Lent. And our readings are going to be the early ministry of Jesus, especially according to Mark. Today we heard a little excerpt from St. John. Today especially, I think, we all have to admit that we're searching. Everyone is searching. Everyone is seeking something. And that is formed from a very young age. If our parents do a very effective job in informing us, and most parents do a fairly effective job, even if they're not completely clear about what they're doing, the parents usually do an effective job of helping a child to understand that we seek. We look for things. I mean, when we're hungry, we go seek food. When we're thirsty, we go get something to drink. When we're tired, we find a bed. These are just normal things, the normal course of what we do from day to day of trying to satisfy, if you will, our needs, of trying to make sure that we are comforted somehow so that when our needs come, we can put them aside. But parents do a masterful job in teaching us how to do it right. I know like when I was younger, I sure would have loved to have the cake before dinner, but that never happened. You know, you, you know what I'm talking about. I, that, that never happened. I mean, you know, there was things that I would have much preferred to have, you know, cookies instead of my, my carrots. Yeah, I can go down the whole list. But it's a parent's responsibility because the parent knows better than the child will ever know. Yes, you are seeking something, but you need to seek something that's healthy, that's good. You need to be doing what's better for you so that as you grow up, you will grow up and be a strong and healthy person. Now, we human beings, we're imperfect, and so we strive to do our best to do things the right way. And sure, many of us may have a poor diet even still, and many of us may have come from, from a family of origin that wasn't so good at things like that, or parents that really weren't good parents. I can go through the whole list, but I'm gonna save that for a couple of weeks from now. Suffice it to say that as we introduce this five-week series, 
we have to admit that everyone is searching. Everyone is searching, and that search will pan out in our lives in a variety of different ways. But I guarantee you here right now that even though it pans out in a variety of different ways, until people come to the realization of what they're actually searching for, they will keep filling it poorly. Until people come to that realization. And that's why when it comes to handing on the faith especially, and cultivating a young person who eventually will become an adult, and cultivating a young person in the faith, it is so essential that we as a community, and especially the community of the family, help a young person to recognize what they're truly searching for. And it took St. Augustine a good portion of his life to realize that it was God who created him for himself. And so what did God do? He put something in your soul that will keep drawing you back to him, even if you don't know it, even if you don't recognize it. How many people I talk with nowadays, so many people are renouncing the faith in large numbers. So many young people are just turning away from the faith and renouncing that faith is even needed. Get all your gusto in this life. I mean, how many, how many young people I hear all, you know, no, no I'm going to become successful. I'm going to make a million dollars. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. All investing in this life because of a breakdown, I believe, in the transmission of the faith, starting with the church herself and all the way down into our homes. Even though we've done the right thing, we brought them to church, even though we, we taught them the prayers, even though for some reason that's all breaking down. And I'm going to say this as clearly as I can. This has been going on since the beginning of time. If you do Bible in a year with Father Mike Schmidt, you're going to hear there's a lot of broken families in the Bible. You hear a lot of strange things that happen in the Bible. So there's been breakdowns, and it's not always just within the family, but in the greater society. And so we have to look at what's around us. There was that expression many, many years ago. I think my mother had a thing hanging on the wall. Children live what they learn and learn what they live. That, that kind of thing where whatever's going on. I myself, when I was in college, came up with my own little pithy statement. We become a function of our environment. If you live in a house of anger, we become angry. If you live in a house with alcoholics, the odds are you'll become an alcoholic. If you live in a house with those who are verbally abusive, chances are you're going to become verbally abusive. Now, that chain can be broken and has been broken many, many times. I'm not saying that it's an absolute, but what we surround ourselves with makes all the difference. That's why St. Paul is making it so clear that God didn't create you for immorality. And yet sometimes our searching, our seeking, our wanting leads us down a path of immorality, leads us down to doing things that are called sins. And so please keep in mind that, yes, we are called to something greater, something better. We are called to a life of holiness. We are called to a, a life of, with Jesus Christ. And that is in us, no matter whether we want to acknowledge it or not, God created us for himself. And we will remain restless until we basically come to him. How many people I've watched in my own, even in my own life, coming to Christ, and suddenly there's that like catharsis that this is finally it. Now I'm finally getting it. Now I'm feeling it. And so that's why it's so important to look at our Gospels, especially these next few weeks. We're going to get two weeks like this. Jesus is going to be calling disciples. Jesus is going to be going. Notice the two that come with St. John the Baptist today. We're coming right off the baptism. So notice the two. Look, there's the Lamb of God. They knew in their hearts that's what they were really looking for. They might have been following John the Baptist, hoping that this would happen, and it did. But then Jesus turns to them, what are you looking for? We're going to hear that again in a couple of weeks. What are you looking for? And they have to admit, well, where, where do you stay? <laughs> it's kind of an odd answer, don't you think? You know, oh, we, we're, well, we're looking for the Messiah, but you know, I don't know, let's just find out where you're staying. Maybe that'll give us an insight. Maybe you're sleeping in a synagogue or something. I don't know. Where are you staying? Well, come and see. Come and find out. And what's the very first thing that Andrew does? He goes and gets someone else, his brother. And what happens then? More and more. They're out. That's the key thing. People are searching. If you start to find Jesus, 
Don't hold back. Tell others, I think I found the answer. My heart is searching. My heart is restless. And guess what? I found Jesus. And now my heart is no longer restless. I'm no longer pursuing satisfaction in things that never satisfy. I'm no longer pursuing these things that only give me temporary respite. I found what truly satisfies. Everyone is searching. And the way that search pans out will basically be the determinant for how that person is going to live their life. And you know as well as I do, if you've even experienced that conversion, that moment where you've embraced Jesus Christ, you know as well as I do that all those other things suddenly pale in comparison and you recognize that your life has to be different. So this week and next, we're going to hear these calls, calling to the disciples and saying, come follow me. Figure it out. You knew what you were looking for. You were looking for me. Now come and follow me. But then we're going to hear several miracles in a row. We're going to hear the healing of um, the, there's going to be a demon in the synagogue. There's going to be the healing of um, Simon's mother-in-law. And then there's going to be a healing of a leper. Jesus is doing these miracles. And Mark's gospel, especially right in the beginning, makes it very clear. The miracles are getting attention. And people are coming to find out who this is. And when they get there, they're finding out, well, yeah, the miracles are important, but he's the one that's speaking to my heart. He's the one speaking with authority. He's the one that's bringing something different. And what does Jesus keep doing? He puts up another billboard and says, come, everybody, I'm the one, I'm great. Everybody hang around. I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to stay here in Capernaum, and we're all going to have just one big happy fest as long as you make me greater. He doesn't do that. Come on. What does he do? He keeps slipping away and slipping away and going off to pray and saying, no, 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 no. The miracles are good. The miracles are important. I'm glad I got your intention. Here's the message. I got your attention, but here's what's important. So, yes, I hope whatever healing you need, you get that healing, that physical bodily thing, as we heard from St. Paul. Healing whatever sin we do in the body, especially the sins. But what's his message going to be? Here's a little trivia for you. One of the very first words Jesus speaks in the Gospel of Mark. It's a very, there's no long introduction. We were right in chapter 1, right in the very beginning. The very first words that Jesus speaks in the Gospel of Mark, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's his message. That's it. He's going to give all sorts of parables and teachings and other things, and they're all going to be because he's given you his thesis statement. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, what am I seeking? I'm seeking him. I'm seeking love. I'm seeking hope. I'm seeking peace. And so, when we come to Jesus, our lives change. And as our lives change, the satisfaction only becomes more secure. When I turn away from sins, as St. Paul, you know, the people in Corinth were very corrupt people. Before St. Paul got there, I don't even want to tell you some of the things that they were doing. And yet they want to keep doing it. So just because we come to Christ doesn't mean automatically that whatever the sin is, is just going to stop. No, they kept doing it and they're trying to find justifications how they can keep doing it and still follow Jesus Christ. It's not going to work. And that's why their hearts are restless. And they're saying, all right, St. Paul, you came here. You told us about this Jesus. Why is my heart still restless? And he's got to answer that question. Well, it's still restless because you're still doing what you used to do. You're still sinning in the body. So change that. So change that. And so over the next couple of weeks, let's admit everyone is searching. Every human being that you're going to encounter today, every human being that you're going to look at today, every human being that you will encounter tomorrow and the day after is searching for Jesus. They won't say that, but we have to know that. You are searching for Jesus. And you may be sitting here week after week, year after year, and are still restless. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. And let him start what he can do. Go to him and say, what are you looking for? That's what he's going to say to you. Let him know. I'm looking for you, O oh Lord. I need more of you in my life. I need to find some way to get this restlessness out of my life so that I stop chasing all of those things that don't really satisfy. I need Jesus. And once we can admit that, then we're on the right road. 
So in these weeks leading up to Lent, I'm asking everybody now to start preparing for your Lenten journey, admitting that you're searching and seeking and try to figure out how you can get that focus the right way so that as we enter into Lent, we have a clear idea of what has to change in our lives. And as we enter into Lent, we will be prepared to make those changes to our Lenten journey. But in these five weeks, we really need to admit that our hearts are restless and they will never be resting until they rest in Jesus. So may God give you that grace to understand what truly is that your heart wants. Your heart wants him, but you have to admit it first. God bless you.